Wow. We really do need a bigger house. That's one thing said that. The people behind, this is theatering around this evening. This is just uh, astonishing. This is easily the biggest crowd we've had for an event, I'd say, uh, educational lecture, which is wonderful to see so much interest. Um, well, my name is Gareth Evans. I'm the director here uh, at the Belgian Mansion. Um, today is, is William Benjamin Gould's day. Uh, and to prove that, <laughs> we actually have three of them here. One, two, and three over there. Yeah, so, uh, yeah. um, today was the day where we received a North Carolina historic marker, a highway marker, which is out in front of the uh, house here. Um, it's kind of a, a real honor for us to have that day, and we've been looking to get it for many, many years uh, to honor a story and a person who is historically important, and it's just a fabulously good story, as you'll hear uh, this evening. Um, the history is, is something we tell on tour every day, and I do in my talks out and about, and is spread far and wide by our volunteers as well who give the tours. Um, it's something which is integral to the, the history of this site, and we're very proud to be able to impart it. Can you all hear me back there? Yeah. 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 Excellent. Okay. And at the back, you're okay too? Yeah. All right. Um, I want to thank the family, uh, the Gould family, many of them are right here with us today. Thank you all very much for coming. Uh, I know you've all come from a very long distance. I'm going to let you know a couple of housekeeping things. We're on camera. Uh, we're filming this today, and so later on we'll be putting that on our YouTube channel so we can keep it for posterity. I'm going to mention that after the events, after we talk tonight, uh, there are books to be signed across the way, Diary of the Contraband. There are snacks, and actually, uh, Leslie, our site manager, has, um, operations manager, has put out artifacts, pieces that were built uh, by enslaved workers and artisans here, including pieces of plaster, uh, including woodwork and things like that from the period, which are in our collection. So you can actually experience those as well and see the, the delicacy and brilliance of craftsmanship that went into building this site. Um, I do want to thank, I didn't do this earlier today, and I was very remiss, but we had a, a opening of the market. Leslie, are you here? Where's Leslie? She's on the porch. Oh, she's on the porch. Leslie's our site manager. After all these years of trying to get... <laughs> come in. After all these years of trying to get the market, Leslie wrote the application and actually got it. <laughs> so we're very proud of that. We did a wonderful job with it as well. Um, so, having said that, is Barbara Coleman? Yeah. There you are, there you are, okay. I did want to mention that there's a lot of history in the room with us as well, as well as this family. Barbara is one of the Taylor family, another enslaved artisan worker, Henry Taylor, worked on this house. It's another wonderful story that we have about this site. Uh, that whole family which went through, a guy who built Tuskegee and was the first uh, African-American graduate from MIT, and then all the way down to the White House of Valerie Jarrett, it's the same lineage. In, uh, in Barbara's family as well, so we have a lot of wonderful stories connected to this place. Oh, there we are. Okay, more people everywhere. Okay, we have history <laughs> all over the place. All right, so I'll, I'll be quiet now. Um, please do explore the site after we've done talking and don't run away. We're here as long as you want to ask questions. Tonight's speaker uh, is William Benjamin Gould the fourth. He is a PhD professor of law emeritus at Stanford University. Um, he was chair of the National Labor Relations Board in the uh, Clinton administration, and of course is the author of our topic tonight, which is Diary of a Contraband, uh, right here, a very well thumbed version indeed, um, which is just a fabulous story from beginning to end and in context and in every other way. So uh, thank you all very much for coming. Thank you back there. I'll um, leave you with Professor Gould. Good, good. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Gareth, and uh, uh, thanks to all of you for uh, for coming here. Um, I want to. Uh, you hold uh, it up. Uh, uh, okay. You got it. Um, I have a tendency as the evening goes on to wind up a little bit more, so I think I should be. Uh, you should hear me more easily as uh, as uh, we move along. Um, I. Uh, uh, I want to thank again uh, 
Gareth and the uh, Bellamy Mansion that uh, have uh, played such a critical role in both uh, the research that I was able to do over many years about William B. Gould and uh, uh, also uh, making, uh, his, uh, making his name and his work uh, so well known. And of course to Beverly Tennyson who got me started uh, really uh, uh, when I came to see her in 1996 um, and uh, came over here to the Bellamy Mansion and has been said by many, uh, looked at the lovely uh, plastering that had been done not knowing that that work was done by uh, William B. Gould at the time. And I remember the very excited telephone call that I got from Jonathan Nofke, the curator at that time of the uh, mansion. So thanks to uh, all of you. And I want to briefly acknowledge uh, uh, my uh, family, uh, Hilda, and uh, my, uh, my grandchildren, uh, William Benjamin VI and Elena, sitting right here in the front row, and uh, William Benjamin V, uh, who has played such a major role in this, and uh, his, uh, his wife, Darina, and also uh, uh, my, uh, uh, my niece, uh, uh, Heidi Gerber, who is the uh, daughter of uh, my sister, Dorothy, who came here uh, in 2003 when we, to this city, when we uh, first uh, uh, recognized uh, William B. Gould with the uh, kiosk down at Orange Street from where he made his uh, escape. Um, I, I want to say just preliminarily uh, that, um, uh, that uh, one other thing, it's ironic that uh, we're staying in the Worth House, uh, which was arranged by the Bellevue Mansion, because uh, my great-grandmother, uh, who was to marry my great-grandfather at the end of the war, um, she um, uh, was purchased out of slavery from here in Wilmington in 1857. And uh, uh, she was uh, owned uh, by um, uh, the, uh, uh, the, one of the uh, Confederate, uh, guys who became a uh, uh, Confederate leader during the uh, war, and uh, uh, the uh, Lewis Tappan, of New York arranged to uh, raise the sum, the princely sum of one thousand uh, dollars, to uh, free her uh, from uh, uh, Wilmington and to bring her to Nantucket, Massachusetts. And uh, uh, one person in Wilmington um, uh, contributed to her freedom, and that was uh, uh, Mr. Worth. And uh, it's so ironic that uh, we should be staying. Uh, at his uh, place uh, when we uh, when we come here, um, the um, uh, William B. Gould, uh, born 1837, uh, was to live until uh, 1923. Um, he, um, uh, we don't know a great deal about his life uh, prior to his uh, uh, freedom. Uh, one of the difficulties in doing research about uh, him is that uh, he um, uh, didn't uh, he didn't have a sense of personal grievance. He didn't have a sense of uh, uh, he was very much like uh, my so much of him puts me in mind of my father, uh, who never spoke uh, about the harm that had been visited upon him by. Uh, uh, the society in which uh, we lived. Uh, and that is true of William B. Gould. On Sunday night, September 21, 1862, he, uh, with seven other men, go to uh, uh, the Orange, bottom of Orange Street and have a small boat that they uh, are uh, able to row down the 28 nautical miles down the Cape Fear River. Uh, to uh, uh, the Atlantic, uh, uh, the Atlantic Ocean, uh, down the river, and they dare not raise uh, sails because uh, posted along the way are Confederate uh, sentries looking for escaping slaves. And there were a number of them, uh, we now know, uh, r right around the time of uh, William B. Gould. And he said that, uh, in recounting this later, he said that uh, 
The eight men must take turns at the oar on this uh, journey to, uh, I'm thinking so much of this language as I uh, uh, saw some of the citations around here, uh, leave the land of chivalry and to seek protection under the banner of the free. And so it will take a, entire, the entire night of September 21, September 22, uh, for him to uh, uh, avoid detection and to get to the USS Cambridge uh, uh, in the, uh, uh, on the Union Navy. And uh, he is uh, 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 accepted, as he said a couple of years later, later greeted uh, by the uh, uh, officers on the Cambridge uh, because at that time, uh, the government was beginning to pursue a policy uh, followed in halts and starts uh, uh, in the Navy prior to the fall of 1862 of deliberately recruiting uh, uh, blacks who were escaping uh, from the uh, southern states uh, and were of uh, value until that time uh, because they knew the uh, uh, area and they knew where, where often where the Confederates had their uh, facilities located, their weapons located. Uh, until that time, uh, many of the uh, commanders had been returning escaping slaves uh, because uh, the law of Dred Scott was still the law. They were still the property of their masters, and uh, uh, some of the commanders commanders felt obliged to return them. Well. Uh, that was self-defeating, of course, because the Confederates uh, put those returned slaves to work on their behalf, and that was not in the interests of the United States. And so they hit upon the idea of uh, contraband, of uh, uh, the, uh, uh, we will call them seized property. And so my great-grandfather and the seven others, uh, when they board the ship, are called in the log of the ship, uh, we, they say, uh, eight contraband uh, came on board, and uh, five uh, day and two, five days later, uh, he, as he said, uh, uh, took his uh, pledge of allegiance to the government of Uncle Samuel. He often talks about Uncle Sam as Uncle Samuel, and uh, he said, uh, uh, "We uh, 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 and and thus commences this diary, which really opens the door." for us to learn something about him and his time. Most of the diary is dated and uh, uh, put together very carefully, but there are some undated uh, columns, uh, some se undated sections. Um, one of them is uh, uh, the, um, uh, a, a portion which uh, appears towards the beginning, in which he talks about the Negro and his friends and foes. He says, we will now begin by looking far into the past, beyond the Declaration of Independence of 76, to that memorable day of 11 of December, 1614, when 11 Negro slaves landed at Jamestown, Virginia, and ask you, was it for any act of friendship that those benighted Africans were torn from their loved homes off the free plains of Africa's shores and transferred to the wilderness of America? Was it an act of friendship that those Dutch traders exposed those Negroes for sale? Was it an act of friendship that caused them to buy those misfortunate ones and to make them the hewers of wood, the drawers of water, to clear their land, to build their cities, and to feed their mouths? And from the doings of that eventful day spring all the evils of slavery in this country. From that day's work spring the, and here the passage is, uh, is incomplete. Well, um, he wanted, as I said in my remarks today, very much uh, to uh, be a part of what he came to call uh, the cause of, uh, of equality cause of, uh, of uh, right. Uh, he did not know that on the day in which he escaped, uh, President Lincoln had convened a cabinet meeting to uh, discuss and to finish uh, the so-called preliminary 
Emancipation Proclamation. Throughout the summer of 1862, the president has been struggling with the question of uh, when to make this move. He has tried to negotiate with the border states a compensation uh, for slaves in the states of Kentucky, Maryland, Missouri. Uh, President Lincoln said, uh, uh, I hope that God is on my side, but I must have Kentucky. And, uh, and he wanted Kentucky because Kentucky was key to the navigable waters that were so important for uh, United States dominance uh, in the beginnings of the war. We think of a man who at that point would have been heard a little of, uh, Ulysses S. Grant, but whose great rise to prominence uh, came through his uh, conquests. Uh, we, we went uh, down to Mississippi to see his first great victory at Vicksburg uh, in uh, 1863. Uh, and that came about because of the, uh, the focus of President Lincoln to rebuild the United States Navy, which had become uh, 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 very slow and moribund, and to make it available and to make it available to pursue three different avenues. One was the control of the navigable waters, and the second was uh, to um, uh, to uh, um, engage in something that William B. Gould became involved in the North Atlantic. Uh, uh, blockading squadron, which was designed to uh, pursue a policy of anaconda to economic strangulation uh, of the Southeast, which is what was aimed, uh, and to shut off supplies that were going to uh, Lee's uh, army in, uh, uh, in Virginia. William B. Gould became involved in that, and uh, the third part of it was to pursue uh, the Confederate vessels that were being built uh, for the Confederacy by the British and the French, and uh, he was to embark upon uh, a, uh, the pursuit of those vessels uh, beginning, of the, uh, beginning in the summer of uh, 1864. But when we first uh, uh, find William B. Gould, uh, uh, we find him uh, in, uh, in, in battle uh, uh, in, uh, as part of the North Atlantic uh, blockading a, a squadron. Um, he is uh, um, uh, involved in uh, a number of uh, uh, efforts to uh, stop uh, ships from uh, getting to, uh, uh, from uh, delivering goods to the uh, southeast. The, um, uh, he uh, uh, is uh, involved, if I can just uh, Find us a second in uh, in uh, the uh, uh, pursuit of uh, uh, pursuit of a number of vessels, uh, and uh, I don't focus a lot here at this particular moment. But he, uh, uh, oh, here here he is. Uh, he says that uh, um, he talks about uh, the fact that uh, uh, in the USS Cambridge, uh, he says shots are coming at his ship. Uh, from the uh, from Fort Fisher on the shore of North Carolina, he says those shots are are uh, coming a little bit too close to be at all agreeable. <laughs> and, uh, in a similar vein, he, he comments on the, the fire that his ship takes from the fort a few days earlier, and he says the rebels. Well, he talks about Johnny Rebel uh, knew that they had. Uh, they had done some very close shooting, showed that they knew their work. When in mid-November 1862, the Cambridge happens on a uh, Confederate ship, he laconically writes, we told them good morning in the shape of a shot. And he uh, notes of, uh, of a later engagement that uh, uh, we bore down on them and, and send our respects from our parrot, our ship's uh, uh, gun. Um, William B. Gould is, uh, uh, this period is, in, is, is one in which uh, they capture a number of ships. They uh, uh, have some defeats as well, which he talks about. And um, he, uh, he is uh, always understated 
uh, sardonic kind of dry wit, which again puts me very much in the mind of my of my father uh, when he says, uh, uh, for instance, uh, 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 we uh, uh, when a ship runs into heavy weather, uh, he says uh, uh, the weather is very unsettled. Uh, the commander of the ship says thunder and lightning with heavy rains and squalls. Um, and that's, uh, and one, one of the uh, ways I did research about William B. Gould was to go through the entire diplomatic record, to go through the logs that his commanders, all the entries that his commanders had entered, and to compare them uh, step by step uh, by what, with what he was saying. And as a friend of uh, mine said to me once, it may have been Beverly, uh, when I, I said, uh, gosh, he really got it right. No, no they got it right. <laughs> and he, he was he uh, recounts uh, uh, these uh, uh, these events on a uh, day by day uh, uh, basis. Well, many of you may have seen the movie Glory, uh, where uh, uh, blacks are first uh, brought into the United States Army. Uh, as many of you may or may not know, from 1792 through 1863. Uh, no blacks were allowed to serve in the United States Army. It's rather curious, given the fact that the period, during the period of time that I was brought up, uh, the Navy was the most racially exclusionary branch of the service. But blacks have always been a seafaring people in the North American continent and had a great deal of exposure to the sea. Indeed, when I look at some of the things that William B. Gould says, and the way he speaks a little derisively about some of the, his new landlubber co uh, comrades who brought on the ship, I think that he perhaps had some exposure and experience prior to this war. Um, and so uh, with this background, uh, it's uh, from, the, from the very beginnings of the war, a few blacks begin to serve. When William B. Gould comes uh, on to the United States uh, Cambridge, uh, he is uh, brought in at the lowest possible rank. Blacks cannot advance above the rank of boy. Uh, and then eventually he is promoted to landsman. And eventually he becomes a petty officer. So it's a policy of, uh, uh, but it's in contrast to the Army. Uh, there isn't the exclusion that the Army had. Uh, and uh, you begin to get, the Navy is not able to benefit from the draft that uh, the United States brings into existence. And they, they need manpower, and so they bring in uh, many like um, uh, William B. Gould. Um, and uh, what this means uh, is uh, uh, arms, arms, in the hands of, uh, arms in the hands of slaves. Uh, uh, the recruitment of blacks, uh, in the words of General Grant, was designed to make it terrible for the enemy. Again, in the words of James McPherson, the uh, eminent historian, arms in the hands of the slaves constituted the South ultimate revolutionary nightmare. After initial hesitation, Lincoln embraced this revolution as well. And uh, he uh, goes on to uh, uh, fight for uh, uh, some period as part of this North Atlantic blockade. In the early part of 1863, the crew is given uh, time off uh, to uh, visit some of the ports. They've been, some of them have been at sea for longer than he has. Uh, they uh, uh, go to uh, first to Virginia, where he uh, reunites with uh, friends that he wrote about. Uh, um, uh, and I'll be glad to talk a little bit about Newport, Virginia, and some of the things he saw there in question and answer. He then goes on to New York and Boston. He seems to know a lot of people. He's a, he's a great correspondent. In the diary, he's always speaking of letters from uh, a, a, a wide variety of people with initials. The most prominent, of course, is CWR which is Cornelia Williams Reed, who uh, uh, was born in Charleston, South Carolina, but brought enslaved here to Wilmington, 
North Carolina, and later he was to say in his pension papers that I have known her since she was a uh, child. Uh, and he goes to visit her, and uh, uh, it's, it's of interest to me that uh, the correspondence begins to uh, pick up uh, considerably after that visit in uh, May of 1863. He's corresponding with many people. He's corresponding with uh, his nephew, George Mattson, who's to become the first black lawyer in North Carolina. Uh, he uh, corresponds with uh, others who become prominent in uh, Reconstruction uh, government here uh, after the war. And we have every reason to believe that he remained in contact with them uh, when the war had uh, ended. Um, he returned here once after the war had ended and wrote a very interesting essay about the way in which uh, what he saw compared to uh, uh, what, he had, uh, what he had seen uh, uh, earlier. Uh, he, in the summer of 1863, he takes ill in Massachusetts. He's in the hospital for a period of time with the measles, and during this time, uh, his uh, physician uh, becomes a big pal of his, and they have a number of discussions and uh, the physician suggests to him that uh, maybe uh, he would find uh, serving on another ship, uh, which is about to uh, leave on a very important journey, would be of interest to him. And this is the USS Niagara, a more formidable, uh, substantial ship than the steam frigate uh, USS uh, Cambridge. And so uh, he expresses uh, a great interest in this and joins the Niagara. Uh, in the uh, late summer of 1863. They uh, begin to, the Niagara begins to do a number of things. Uh, the thing that interests William B. Gould is that uh, his physician has told him the Niagara is going to go to Europe and you'll see some very interesting things and they're going to be pursuing the Confederate vessels that are being built uh, for, uh, the, for the Confederacy by, uh, by Europe. But before that, um, they uh, uh, begin uh, uh, with uh, uh, a, uh, before that they begin with a visit to Gloucester, Massachusetts. I went to Gloucester and uh, looked at all the newspapers involved, which described the Niagara. That they're trying to recruit more people in uh, in Gloucester. Um, uh, not too popular. Not too many people want to join the Navy, particularly at these, uh, under these circumstances, uh, even though uh, this is uh, subsequent to the great battle of Antietam in Maryland. Antietam is really what uh, made President Lincoln uh, finally decide to move ahead with uh, the Emancipation Proclamation. Uh, in, the, uh, in June of 1862, Secretary of State Seward has said to Lincoln, don't do it before until you, uh, until you uh, get a great victory, um, because uh, it will, this will be taken as a sign of uh, weakness if you uh, emancipate before a great victory. Uh, finally comes Antietam, which is not a victory, but which sends uh, Lee, uh, uh, it dashes Lee's hopes of a northern advance and sends him uh, scurrying back across the uh, Potomac not to be pursued, much to Lincoln's consternation by uh, uh, the very uh, uh, self-absorbed General McClellan. Um, but uh, uh, the, uh, uh, so in the summer of 1863, we now have uh, William P. Gould uh, on the Niagara and um, uh, the, uh, uh, about to uh, go to Europe, but before they get a chance, uh, to go to Europe, um, a number of uh, things happened to them. Um, the first is the, uh, uh, is the fact that uh, a, uh, a, a United States uh, naval vessel is hijacked by the Confederates, taken up to Canada. Canada, of course, is a colony of Britain. Um, uh, Britain is unfriendly uh, to the United States. Uh, and really about, uh, uh, at least in late 62, to throw in with the Confederacy, the Emancipation Proclamation 
has a tendency to stop that because uh, so much of British popular opinion, even though not British leadership, is, uh, is for the end of uh, uh, slavery. Uh, they go up to Canada, recover uh, the, ship, uh, the ship up there, and uh, have quite an adventure. And uh, William Beagle says that they were calling us all kinds of names and, uh, as, we, uh, as we returned. Well, then they have another uh, great event, and that is an Italian vessel is caught in a storm in the Atlantic, and uh, his ship, the Niagara, is uh, told to, uh, to pursue her. Big storm. And listen to what he says about this in his diary. He said, All last night, we went before the gale. The gale still blows fresh, and the seas running high. We shipped through the night, and one sea, sea uh, filled the wardroom with water. I got decked awfully last night, but it was worth something to be upon the deck. Although there is much danger in the storm, uh, there is something very sublime in one. To hear the roar of the storm, the hissing of the waves, the whistling of the rigging and cannon-like repeat of the torn sail, and above all, the stern word of command and the shrill sound of the boatsman's pipe, all adds to the grandeur of the scene. For there is something grand in a storm. All night, with eager eyes, both officers and men pace the deck, watching on foretopsail, feeling in a measure secure as long as we could carry sail at all. But it stood through the night, and there is no sign of the storm abating. All the galley fire is out, and nothing to eat is the cry, and almost nothing to wear on account of the water. Shine out, fair sun, and smoke the waves that we may proceed on our course and all be saved. And they are saved. Uh, as the New York Times said in discussing this, the Niagara again experienced a severe storm of hail, rain, and sleet, and uh, she was delivered from the jaws of, uh, from the jaws of death. Well, uh, it's... Uh, it's on to, his ship is stationed for the most part, the Niagara, in New York City, uh, but then it's soon on to, uh, to Europe, which is the, uh, which is the initial uh, mission which, which uh, uh, have, has been described to, uh, to William B. Gould. And uh, uh, the, uh, on June 1, the ship gets ready to depart. And he said uh, uh, he was pressed into service to, to work as a cook. He said there wasn't a, the regular cook was ill. Um, um, and he said, uh, here we were left without a cook. But I attempted to get the dinner ready amid the greatest confusion imaginable. By 3 o'clock, all our stores arrived. And the pilot being on board, the shrill notes of the fife, the regular tramp of the men, together with the clank of the capstan, all told that we were soon to feel the motion of the swelling sea, our anchor being weighed, and we steamed out and uh, discharged the pilot off uh, Sandy Hook. And uh, uh, in the diplomatic correspondence, his commander notes that even he himself was not told uh, what the whale ship was to be. Uh, proceeding because of the uh, fact that, uh, because uh, of the concern that uh, this information might get to others, let alone and, and uh, uh, be known by the uh, uh, Confederacy. They're looking for the Florida, um, which uh, uh, was commanded by the uh, owner of, uh, of my great-grandmother. Um, uh, whom I alluded to uh, earlier. But they don't find the Florida. The Florida later runs in trouble and the Union gets her in, uh, in Brazil. But uh, they're also interested in the Alabama. And uh, uh, the, uh, uh, 
the, uh, uh, William B. Gould describes uh, going up the English Channel in pursuit of looking for the uh, Alabama on June 24, 1864. He said, running up the English Channel under sail alone, um, he said, uh, uh, we, about three, mil three bells, we took on board the English pilot who brought on the thrice glorious news of the sinking of the Alabama uh, by the sloop Cressage off Sherbourg. Um, uh, while we are, uh, uh, we are dissatisfied and disappointed that we didn't get a shot at her, uh, we are satisfied that she's out of the way. And years later, writing about this on the 50th anniversary of the Civil War, uh, William B. Gould said, uh, the crew was almost as proud as if they had done the deed themselves. Uh, well, they do get to do some uh, deeds, and uh, uh, they proceed on to the Bay of Biscay, where they intercept, intercept a ship built in Britain, proceeding from uh, uh, Liverpool. And he says on August 4th, 15, 1864, um, we are, uh, 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 we, we, we saw many sails and we saw a steamer and we stood for her. We beat the quarters. She suddenly changed her course. We beat the quarters and fired, fired a shot. She showed the English colors. We fired another. When she came on, when, when, when she came to, we boarded her and found her to be the rebel privateer, Georgia, from Liverpool. Uh, and he says, uh, uh, the, uh, on her way to refit as a cruiser, but the next cruise that she makes will be for Uncle Samuel. Uh, a very pretty vessel, he says. Um, all Englishmen on the ship, he said, they said they shipped in her to go to the coast of Africa, but they made a short voyage. The Georgia takes a mail to the States, and so I availed uh, myself of writing to CWR. Many times he says, oh, CWR, why haven't I...